Hold on to your stormy Cromer, because here comes another one of our patented UP adventures. We'll show you a lake in the clouds that will blow your majestic mind, hit Houghton Hancock for a beer lover's brewery, and take a trip deep under Copper Country. Then we hit a historic bar with pickled pleasures and a place where you can eat, drink, and sleep with Lake Superior tickling your toes. Get ready to explore the cool people, places, and things that make Michigan's Upper Peninsula a great place to be. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. As we cross a bridge known as the Mighty Mac, we find it, something the Ojibwa call Gajige. We know it as timeless, a land that says, slow down, Listen to my stories, hear my songs. Timeless can be as big as the sunset on a great lake or as endless as the stars that watch over us. Welcome to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Welcome to the purest of pure Michigan. Your trip begins at michigan.org. And by Big B Coffee, celebrating 18 years as a Michigan company. Gift cards, mugs, and coffee by the pound available in store and online. Franchise info available at BIGGBY.com. I've been around the world, but there's one place I keep coming back to. And the more I explore, the more I realize it's the place to be. I'm Tom Dalton, and this is Under the Radar, Michigan. If you haven't been to Michigan's beautiful Upper Peninsula yet, what's your excuse this time? Are you allergic to fresh air? You're afraid of bridges? Your dog ate your driver's license? For gosh sakes, cut it out! Michigan's incredible UP is what I like to call our own out west. And it's right here. From pristine forests and waterfalls to fabulous art and fantastic food finds, everything you need for a true Michigan adventure is all over the UP. And even if you're a city slicker, there's enough energy, culture, history, and architecture up here to keep you happily hopping from town to town. It truly is a treasure that more of us need to explore. Michigan's Upper Peninsula is conveniently located north of the Lower Peninsula, right on the other side of the mighty Mackinac Bridge. <laughs> you can't miss it. Well, we just passed over the Mackinac Bridge, and now we're going to turn left and head west to a Michigan mountain range that's named after one of my favorite little land mammals. Because not only are they cute, they're pretty sharp, too. But first, some gratuitous driving shots. The Porcupine Mountains are located in the UP's extreme northwest wilderness. It's a ways, but well worth the drive. This state park is over 60,000 acres of ancient mountains, towering virgin timber, remote trails, wild rivers, and secluded lakes. And speaking of secluded lakes, there's one place here at the Porkies I've always wanted to see. And the short hike to it is even suitable for a low plains flatlander like me. It's called Lake of the Clouds. And to make sure we found our way to and from it, I met up with park naturalist Bob Wild. Well, Bob, this is where I usually say wow. But believe it or not, I'm speechless. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is your office. This is so cool. This has got to be one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. I've seen the Grand Canyon. I have not seen the Eiffel Tower. I'm working on that. But still, this is absolutely breathtaking. A pretty typical comment that we get from park visitors when they get here is they, uh, a lot of them say they never knew something like this existed in Michigan. And uh, yeah, you can see why. Is that a deep lake or is it pretty shallow? No, Lake of the Clouds is not very deep. It's only about 15 feet deep. It's about a mile and a quarter long, quarter mile wild, but it's only about 15 feet deep, mm. loaded with smallmouth bass. Uh, now, this it looks like complete wilderness all around the entire lake. Is that true, or is there people? are there people down there camping? Yeah, there could be some people camping. We've got some backcountry campsites that are on the south part of the lake. Um, one of the park's rustic cabins is on kind of down in this corner of the lake, but it is, it's, it's all wilderness. There's no, no roads, no... Uh, no people, that's all park property that you see there. In fact, almost everything you're looking at is all part of the old growth forest of the park as well. So that area's never been logged either. Well, how high in elevation is Lake of the Clouds? 
The lake itself, right now, it's about 300 feet below us. The, the kind of the fun thing about this spot is when, when people get here, you, you know, it feels like you're the top of the world, the highest spot in the park. And in reality, this is the midway point from the lowest elevation to the highest elevation. Lake Superior is the lowest elevation, about 600 feet above sea level. Summit Peak, the highest spot in the park, is 1,958 feet above sea level. And we're about 1,350 here. We're, we're the halfway spot between the lowest and the highest. Really? Yeah, in fact, there's a lake in the park that's 200 feet higher in elevation than what we are right now. What's that one called, Lake of the Stratosphere? <laughs> <laughs> Close, Mirror Lake. <laughs> oh, Mirror Lake, okay. <laughs> now, there's so much beauty to take in at the Porcupine Mountain Wilderness State Park that you might want to stay a few days. And for that, we've got you covered. This is a world-class camping destination for nature lovers far and wide. And with the majestic views of the Lake Superior shoreline just steps away, you'd be hard pressed to find a better place to get your camp on than right here. Hey, if you're feeling kind of Mongolian, they even have these really cool yurts that you can get. Come on, I'll show you. Look at this, huh? Comes with a broom. It's got this cool little table right here. It's got a sunlight. There's bunk beds. It's got a burning, look at this, wood burning stove. Oh, it's still warm. Very nice. And these beds look awesome. Very comfortable. You can even lay down after a hard day of swimming or hiking and Maybe take yourself a little Huh, must have been all that clean UP air. Oh, wow, I feel great now. Uh, Bob? Bob? Now, when I say the UP is our own out west, the next place Bob took us proved that to be absolutely 100% true. Okay, Bob, why didn't you tell me you had waterfalls here too? It's uh, kind of a well-kept secret here in the park. It's the very western end of the park, and this is the scenic Presque Isle River. It's a whole series of waterfalls and water slides surrounded by old-growth forest, fantastic geology. This place alone could easily be a park. Well, yeah, I mean, just to show people how big, or explain how big this park is, it was a 25-mile drive through the park to get here. We actually changed time zones to get here. That's correct. Uh, but it's so well worth the drive. This is spectacular. Yeah, when, uh, this is one of the areas that we highly recommend people visit when they're here. And one thing I always tell people is plan for a lot of time when you get over there because it's just an area that you're just going to want to spend more time at. It is so amazing and a lot of just well-kept secrets. It's just a great spot. The downriver hike Bob took us on was, in a word, spectacular. Around every bend was another view worth a long and lingering look. It's unbelievable how much beauty and extreme wilderness we have at this massive park. You know, I've wanted to see the Porcupine Mountains all my life, and it took me getting a TV show to finally get up here and do it. Don't wait till you get your own TV show. Get up and see this park soon, because it's so beautiful up here, you'll think you're in Michigan. The next morning, we drove back east, turned left at the Keweenaw Peninsula, and drove an hour north into Copper Country and to one of the UP's most historic, energetic, and beautiful cities. Houghton is alive with everything you need to satisfy your urban urges. There's plenty of great places to eat, stay, shop, and play, all in beautiful natural surroundings. The city sits about halfway up the peninsula on the south side of the Keweenaw Waterway and right across the river from the city of Hancock. Houghton also happens to be home to one of Michigan's most prestigious colleges. Michigan Tech is a great school that brings people here from around the world to study science, technology, engineering, and even forestry. And some of them like it here so much, they made their future here. Case in point is Dick Gray of the Keweenaw Brewing Company. He's a former Michigan Tech student who graduated, went away, but came back here to make some beer that I find, well, pretty darn tasty. Now, you're not originally from Houghton. I am not. No, where'd you grow up? Well, I was born and raised in Midland, Michigan. And the university brought you up here? Correct. All right. Tell me why you love that college so much. Well, uh, I like the outdoors. Yeah. I was a resident of Michigan. I was going to pay for the majority of my college. Right. And I wanted to go into engineering. And I also wanted to go into geology. So you graduated from Michigan Tech? I did, actually. I was surprised, but I did, yeah. <laughs> you made it through. Yeah. <laughs> but you went away for a while. Right, I graduated in 1982. My wife and I uh, met here in school and got married in school. And when I graduated, 
The job that I took was out west. But what's the fermentation process that got you back to Michigan? And especially back to the Houghton area. You know, we, all, we loved it up here as students. Uh, we spent summers here, and it was just a beautiful area. And I thought, what a great place to retire. And so that's kind of what we did. Yeah. What, what I love about your story is uh, a lot of young guys start breweries. But here's a couple of guys who are retiring and said, you know what? I want to go someplace great. I want to do something that I want to do, yeah. which is brew beer. Yeah. And you came here to do it. Right. Dick will tell you that he's got the greatest job in the world. And to share his wealth of knowledge, he even hires tons of current and former Michigan Tech students to teach them all about business and beer. How would you describe your beer to somebody who, you know, is looking for a different kind of brew? Well, you know, part of the microbrewing industry is having a lot of variety. And we offer a lot of variety as, you know, with our downtown tap room for certain, we make dozens and dozens of different styles of beer. Well, what we've done is we've taken the most popular beers in our tap room and then produced them in a manufacturing type of facility where we can wholesale that out to our customers. We make an ale, and we call them session ales, things that are enjoyable to drink, have lots of flavor. We make them at a, a moderate alcohol level. We don't get too carried away. And we make them consistent batch to batch so that you, when you open your Widowmaker black ale, it tastes like a Widowmaker. You know, when I stop doing this show, I'm going to open a brewery. I know how to drink beer. Could you teach me how to make beer? Sure. Yeah, you take some grain, you bust it open, you throw some water on it, heat it up, throw it into a fermenter with some uh, yeast. This is oversimplification, of course. <laughs> well, and in that. a couple weeks, voila. <laughs> yeah, like it's that easy, not. No. Well, it takes a little bit of time. I think it's more an issue of, you know, it takes great products and great people to make a great beer. And up here, we've got great products, great water, and great people. Well said. Well, I came, I saw, I drank, then I didn't see so good. So as always, I let Jim drive. But suffice it to say, if you're thirsting for a beer that's got passion for this peninsula, you should start with the Keweenaw Brewing Company. Oh, but remember, always consume your adult malted beverages responsibly. Drive on, Jim. Oh, sorry. Well, with a belly full of brew, I was hankering for some history. So as my head cleared, we headed north over the Portage Lake Lift Bridge, through the historic town of Hancock, and up to the Quincy Mine for a trip down and into this area's fascinating copper mining past. You know, back in the day, this part of Michigan's Upper Peninsula was called Copper Country, and many a penny came out of mines just like this one. And right now, we're going to find out how it all happened. The Quincy Mine Tour is one of the coolest things you can ever do in this part of Michigan. From the incredible towering shaft house, built by the same company that built the Mackinac Bridge, to the world's largest steam hoist still to this day, there's as much history above the ground here as there is below it. And to make sure we left no nugget unturned, I dug up Tom Wright. So I'm guessing this is the part of the mine tour where we actually go down into the mine. We're going down, we'll be going about 1,400 feet down the hill here, and then we will be going about 2,000 feet back into the mine. We'll be about 368 feet underground when we get back to our final destination. 360 feet underground. 360 feet underground. But the mine, originally the mine went how many feet? 9,260 feet, the deepest incline shaft in the world at one time. What, when was this mine in its heyday? When was it like its full functioning capacity? The peak period here was 1910 to 1912. 1911, Quincy Mine employed 2,145 men. Amazing hub of activity here in the Keweenaw. That's incredible. And it was all copper coming out of here. All copper. Richest copper mines in the world at that period. And they found diamonds, they would just discard them. Yeah, they, they got rid of that stuff. They didn't right. need them. If you're going to build an industrial society, you need copper, and we supplied it. At the actual entrance to the mine, we all hopped off the cog railway and onto a steel wagon that transported us way deep into the earth. Now, bear with us. It gets pretty dark down here. Now we're going actually into the mine. How far in do we go before we go down, or are we going down? We're, we're just going to go straight into the hillside. Gotcha. You know, we're going to be about 368 feet underground, going 2,000 feet under. We are going through some of the oldest rock strata in the world that you can put your hands on. 1.1 billion year old rock. Over 400 lava flows put down. We're going through 200 ancient lava flows. And what's the temperature in here right now? 43 degrees year round. I know under the radar does cool things. 
This is cool. As you make your way down into the mine, you really start to get a sense of what these miners' lives were really like. What really blows my mind is the fact that, I mean, we've got lights down here right now, but the guys that worked down here back in the day did it in candlelight? Candlelight. One or two candles going, and see, they're paying for those candles, too. It's taken out of their wages. Mm. So that encourages them to be frugal with those candles. That's amazing to me. So how would they get the copper out? They're going to be hand drilling. They've got hand drill steels. They've got 12-pound sledgehammers to pound those holes, fill them up with black powder, stick a fuse in, run around the corner, blast it, and then you call in the trammers to move it all out of here. In candlelight. In candlelight. Why was copper so important back then? Our country was growing. We're becoming an industrial power, right? On our way to becoming an industrial superpower. Yeah. We need copper. Copper sheathing for our warships to keep barnacles and borers off of the hulls. Copper for brass and for bronze so we can make cannons and arm those warships. Copper to string a telegraph wire from Washington to California, uniting our country. We need copper. In 1868, this district produced about 90% of America's copper. In this mine, roughly half of that 90%, a huge impact on what our country became. Well, this tour is fascinating. I can tell, I mean, you can hear the, the tour group, they're having a great time. It's just amazing the amount of history that you learn when you come down here. What these men did, it's an untold story, the hardship, the danger. Over 253 men died at Quincy alone, yeah. helping make our country what it is. Tom painted such an interesting and detailed picture of the mine's incredible history that not once on the tour did you feel anything but fun and fascination. At the Quincy Mine Tour, they dig deep to make sure you have a blast. You know, after a hard day in the mines, there's nothing like a trip to your favorite saloon, an icy cold beverage, and some pickled eggs. Wait, what did I just say? I heard me right. I said pickled eggs. And at the Douglas House Saloon, they serve those and a whole lot more. This is a place the locals love, and you'll find folks from all walks here. Bob Bubba McGowan takes a lot of pride in preserving not only these eggs, but also this historic Houghton landmark. So you're one of these guys that came up here to go to Michigan Tech, and you never left. I left a couple times. I kept on coming back. Kept coming back? Yeah. What do you love about this town? Oh, the area and the people are just lots of fun. Well, how long have you been at the bar? I've been at the bar for over 30 years. But the Douglas House has been a bar for how long? Since 1890. 1890. It's incredible. But you've been here 30 years. Right, yes I have. You must love it if you I do, them. I do. I, I love bartending, I love the people, I love the city of A lot of students come here? Many generations of students come here, yes. What's the main thing that brings them here? Because I understand you have something pretty special you serve here. Uh, well, we have popcorn, of course, and pickled eggs. And the old bar, you know, it just has character. Right, now tell me this mystical attraction that, this, that these eggs have. Well, they're a little bit hot, a little bit of spice to them, you know, a little, little garlic, a little jalapeno. Because and... I've heard that, that multi-generations, like you said, people come here from all over the Midwest, they come back to this bar. They have pickled eggs. Yes, they do. Eggs. Yeah. And we ship pickled eggs out for people all over the country. I have to ask you, what's a safe number of pickled eggs to consume? I always say never go more than three. Two should really be your limit. Really? Yeah. Well, what, what happens? Or do I not want to know? Well, your intestines just aren't quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that sounds like fun. Time to sit down with the professor of pickled eggs, Bill Labba Sr. So do you eat it whole or you just take a bite out of it? Take the egg, put a veggie on top. Ve a veggie. Put some pepper. Pepper me. Okay, cheers. I said I'd eat one, and that's it. I'm eating one. What do you think? I think it's good. The second one's yours, though. Go ahead. Well, now that I've tried a pickled egg, I can safely say I've tried a pickled egg. But are they good enough for you to come all the way to Houghton to try one for yourself and perhaps never leave? There's only one way to find out. Well, pickled eggs breath and all, the nice folks at the Magnuson Hotel Franklin Square Inn took us in and offered up some great views of the Keweenaw Waterway and the surrounding countryside. We even got to watch the mighty ranger head out, under the bridge, and on its way to Michigan's incredible and remote Isle Royal National Park. 
Oh, and uh, speaking of heading out. Now imagine this, if you will. You're driving along, tired, weary, and all you want is a great place to eat, drink, sleep that's right on the shores of Lake Superior. <laughs> well, guess what? We found it in Eagle River. Behold the Fitz, one of the comfiest, funkiest, faraway places you'll ever wish you had found before. Sure, it's out of the way and way up on the Keweenaw Peninsula, but it's also way cool. In 2008, Mike Lamott and his buddy Mark Ray bought the Fitz, AKA Fitzgerald's Restaurant in Eagle River Inn, went on a mission and turned it into a foody, drinky, sleepy oasis that people from around the country are finding. I read somewhere that you were 23 years old when you bought this place. Yeah, that's correct. I honestly think I still had my paper route when I was 23. <laughs> what possessed we, we had, you? We had paper routes also, and then we did this too. <laughs> well, what possessed you to buy this place? Um, it had been in my family since I was a kid, and uh, I'd moved away briefly, and my partner Mark had just moved back here, and uh, he convinced me to come back and, and do this Crazy. together. Yeah, exactly, yeah. We had no idea what we were getting into, but we uh, took a stab at it. But now it's an inn and a restaurant. Yeah, correct. Has it always been that? Yeah, yeah. Originally, when it was built back in the 50s, it was two separate buildings. It was the hotel, and there was a little cafe next door. And uh, my dad purchased it in, I think, 1980. And he kind of joined those buildings in the early 80s. I read also that you guys kind of, well, after you bought the place, you thought, well, now we own the place. We should probably specialize in something. Yeah. So you kind of nerded out on whiskey. Yeah, that was our first thing that we really kind of dove into head first. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of grew from there. Wow, so you nerded out on whiskey. Yep. Then you guys nerded out on beer. Yep. Because you guys have one of the most incredible selections of especially Michigan brews that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have a lot of great craft beers from Michigan. I mean, Michigan's a great beer state. It's hard not to have good beer. And then you tr then you went on to nerd out on barbecue. Mm -hmm. Now explain how that happened. Uh, it was just another one of those things where it was something we both liked and we knew nothing about it. And uh, I had been researching smokers for a while and I uh, got hooked up with this guy who was a competition barbecuer down in uh, Iowa. And uh, he kind of nurtured us through the initial you know, learning curve of, of doing barbecue. And uh, yeah, it just kind of took off from there. Well, now that you're a few years older, not much, but um, <laughs> would you do it over again? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great experience. It's, I mean, such a unique experience too. I mean, there, there are lots of things that we could have done, but it's just so unique. And you know, the uh, the hard times we've gone through, as well as the good times. I mean, it's just such a formative experience. It's yeah, it's very valuable. Well, you guys are rock stars because, I mean, to to do what you're doing in a remote location like this and be as successful as you guys are, you're doing something right. And this is one of them. <laughs> We may not have found it by accident this time, but the fifth still turned out to be an incredible place to unwind, wet our whistles, fill our tummies, and even get 40 solid winks. Yeah, it may not be close, but once you're here, it's not far at all. So for gosh sakes, get yourself, your friends, and your family up to the UP as soon as you can. I mean, look how much fun we're having. Is this the part where I'm supposed to jump into Lake Superior and swim off into the sunset? <laughs> Perhaps another time. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching Under the Radar Michigan. I really appreciate it. Look, if you want to know more about what we do, where we go, what we have, go to utrmichigan.com. You can get our brand new book, UTR The First 50. You can get DVDs of our shows. You can get wearables, even this brand new hoodie like the one I'm wearing right here. Pretty sweet, huh? So go to utrmichigan.com. You'll have fun, <laughs> I guarantee. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. As we cross a bridge known as the Mighty Mac, we find it, something the Ojibwa call Gajige. We know it as timeless. The land that says, slow down, listen to my stories, hear my songs. Timeless can be as big as the sunset on a great lake or as endless as the stars that watch over us. Welcome to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Welcome 
to the purest of pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. And by Big B Coffee, celebrating 18 years as a Michigan company. Gift cards, mugs, and coffee by the pound available in store and online. Franchise info available at BIGGBY.com. The Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure series raises funds and awareness in the breast cancer fight, celebrates survivorship, and honors those who have lost their battle. Everyone is welcome. Find a Komen Race for the Cure in more than 140 cities at Komen.org. 